a five-minute rule is not conducive to follow-up. Uh, we've seen repeatedly administration witnesses, including Attorney General Barr, spend the first four and a half minutes filibustering, the second, uh, the, the, the last half minute uh, giving a non-responsive answer, and then it's on to the next person. The House Committee on the Judiciary will come to order. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare recesses of the Committee at any time. So we welcome, we welcome everyone to this morning's hearing on oversight of the Department of Justice. I apologize for beginning the hearing late. As many of you know, I was in a minor car accident on the way in this morning. Everyone is fine, ex except perhaps the car, but it did cause a significant delay. I thank the Attorney General and the members for their patience and their flexibility, and uh, we will now begin. But before we begin, I want to acknowledge, uh, I want to note that we are joined this morning by the distinguished majority leader, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Hoyer. Leader Hoyer has long recognized the need for very vigorous congressional oversight of the, of the executive branch under both parties, and we appreciate his presence today as we question the Attorney General. Before we begin, I would like to remind members that we have established an email address and distribution list dedicated to circulating exhibits, motions, or other written materials that members might want to offer as part of our hearing today. If you would like to submit materials, please send them to the email address that has been previously distributed to your offices, and we will circulate the materials to members and staff as quickly as we can. I would also remind all members that guidance from the Office of Attending Physician states that face coverings are required for all meetings in an enclosed space, such as this committee hearing. I expect all members on both sides of the aisle to wear a mask, except when you are speaking. I will now recognize myself for an opening statement. Thank you for being here, Mr. Barr. According to the Congressional Research Service, this is the first time you have appeared before the House Judiciary Committee, both during your first tenure as Attorney General 30 years ago and during your current service in the Trump administration. Welcome. 150 years ago last month, in the aftermath of the Civil War, Congress created the Department of Justice. We did so with two missions in mind. First, we wanted to replace a system of party spoils with a core of professional government attorneys. Yes, these attorneys would be supervised by the Attorney General. And yes, the Attorney General would remain a political appointee. But at its heart, the department would rely on a foundation of professionals dedicated to the impartial administration of the law and an unbiased system of justice. Second, Congress established the Department of Justice to enforce the nation's first civil rights laws after the Civil War. From that moment on, it became the department's responsibility to ensure the right to vote and to stem the tide of systemic racism. Now, not every attorney general in the intervening 150 years has given full expression to these two goals. I am certain that every administration has fallen short of those promises in some way over time. But today, under your leadership, sir, these two objectives are more at risk than at any time in modern history. Your tenure has been marked by a persistent war against the department's professional core in an apparent attempt to secure favors for the president. Others have lost sight of the importance of civil rights laws. But now we see the full force of the federal government brought to bear against citizens demonstrating for the advancement of their own civil rights. There is no precedent for the Department of Justice to actively seek out conflict with American citizens under such flimsy pretext or for such petty purposes. 150 years later, we are again at a pivotal moment in our nation's history, Mr. Barr. We are confronted with a global pandemic that has killed 150,000 Americans and infected more than 16 million worldwide. We are coming to grips with a civil rights struggle long swept under the rug, if not outright ignored, by our government. We are, as a nation, witnessing the federal government turn violently on its own people. And although responsibility for the government's failure to protect the health, safety, and constitutional rights of the American people belong squarely to President Trump. He could not have done this alone. He needed help. And after he finished utterly humiliating his first attorney general, he found you. In your time at the department, 
you have aided and abetted the worst failings of the president. Let us recount just some of the decisions that, has left a, that have left us deeply concerned about the Department of Justice. First, under your leadership, the Department has endangered Americans and violated their constitutional rights by flooding federal law enforcement into the streets of American cities against the wishes of the state and local leaders of those cities to forcefully and unconstitutionally suppress dissent. Second, at your direction, department officials have downplayed the effects of systemic racism and abandoned the victims of police brutality, refused to hold abusive police departments accountable for their actions, and expressed open hostility to the Black Lives Matter movement. Third, in connection with the White, in coordination with the White House, the department has spread disinformation about voter fraud, failed to enforce voting rights laws, and attempted to change the census rules to flaunt the plain text of the Constitution, and even defied court orders on this subject, all in the apparent attempt to assist the President's re-election. Fourth, at the President's request, the Department has amplified the President's conspiracy theories and shielded him from responsibility by blatantly misrepresenting the Mueller report and failing to hold foreign actors accountable for their attacks on our elections, undermining both national security and the Department's professional staff in the process. Fifth, again and again, you personally have interfered with ongoing criminal investigations to protect the President and his allies from the consequences of their actions. When career investigators and prosecutors resisted these brazen, unprecedented actions, you replaced them with less qualified staff who appear to be singularly beholden to you. The message these actions send is clear. In this Justice Department, the President's enemies will be punished and his friends will be protected, no matter the cost, no matter the cost to liberty, no matter the cost to justice. Finally, and perhaps most perniciously, the Department has placed the President's political needs over the public health by challenging stay-at-home orders in the states hit hardest by the pandemic. The, the Department's persistent efforts to gut the Affordable Care Act will make recovery that much harder. These actions come at a price, real damage to our democratic norms, the erosion of the separation of powers, and the loss of faith in the equal administration of justice. In the hands of President Trump, a Department of Justice that adopts a dangerously expansive view of executive power and demonstrates a willingness to shield him from accountability represents a direct threat to the liberty and safety of the country. And we were warned. At your confirmation hearing, Professor Neil Kinkoff testified, and I quote, public confidence in the rule of law depends on there being an attorney general who will not allow the president to do whatever he wants with the Justice Department. William Barr's views of presidential power are so radically mistaken that he is simply the wrong man at the wrong time to be attorney general of the United States, close quote. Again, this failure of leadership comes at great cost. This administration has twisted the Department of Justice into a shadow of its former self, capable of serving most Americans only after it has first served those in power. This committee has a responsibility to protect Americans from that kind of corruption, Mr. Barr. We have a responsibility to ensure that the Justice Department and its Attorney General administer justice equally and fairly. And this is what has brought us to this hearing room today. We want to give you a chance to respond to our questions to these and other matters. And we hope and expect that you will do so in a clear and forthright manner. Our members expect sincere answers today, and our country deserves no less. I now recognize the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan, for his opening statement. Spying. That one word, that's why they're after you, Mr. Attorney General. 15 months ago, April 10th, 2019, in a Senate hearing, you said this sentence, quote, I think spying on a political campaign is a big deal. Spying on a political campaign is a big deal. It sure is. And since that day, since that day, 
When you had the courage to state the truth, they attack you. They've been attacking you every since, every day, every week, for simply stating the truth that the Obama-Biden administration <laughs> spied on the Trump campaign. One year ago, New York Times headline said this. One year ago, quote, FBI sent an investigator posing as assistant to meet with Trump aide in 2016. The FBI sent a young lady who used the name Azra Turk to meet Papadopoulos in September of 2016. They sent someone pretending to be someone else to meet a person associated with the Trump campaign. You know what they call that? You know what they call that? Spying. One month later, October 2016, they used the dossier to spy on Carter Page. The salacious, unverified dossier, Jim Comey's words, not mine. They took it to the FISA court, didn't tell the courts that the Clintons paid for it, didn't tell the court that the guy who wrote the document, Christopher Steele, had already communicated to the Justice Department that he was, quote, desperate to stop Trump from getting elected. And guess what? There were 15 more lies that they told the court. 17 in total, they're outlined by the Inspector General, each and every one of them in his 400-page report. But guess what? Chairman Nadler refuses to allow Mr. Horowitz to come here and testify and answer our questions about the 17 lies the Obama-Biden administration told to the secret court. The Obama-Biden DOJ opened the investigation in July. They used a secret agent lady to spy on Papadopoulos in August. They lied to the FISA court in September, and they did all this without any basis for launching the investigation to begin with. How do we know that? How do we know there was no basis? They told us. Now, they didn't want to tell us, but thanks to Rick Grinnell, who released the transcripts of their testimony, we now know there was no basis for them to start the investigation in the first place. Sally Yates, Rhodes, Samantha Power, Susan Rice. Here's what Susan Rice says. I don't recall intelligence I would consider evidence of a conspiracy. How about James Clapper? I never saw any direct evidence that the Trump campaign or someone in it was conspiring with the Russians to meddle with the election. Say that again. I never saw evidence that the Trump campaign was conspiring, and yet they investigate him. There was never a proper predicate so why'd they do it? There was no reason to do it. Why'd they do it? They told us that too. Peter Strzok, August 2016, asked, is Trump going to win? What's his response? Remember, this is Peter Strzok. This is the guy who ran the investigation. No. No, he's not. We'll stop it. August, Peter Strzok says, we'll stop Trump. September, they spy on Papadopoulos. October, they use the fake dossier to lie to the court. But guess what happens in November? Guess what happens in November? November 8th, 2016, the American people get in their way. 63 million of them to be exact. Not er now everything changes. Now the real focus is, wow, wait a minute, we didn't stop him. He won. Now what do they have to do? They have to do the cover-up. And who do they have to go after? Who's target number one in their cover-up? The former head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, the guy who's about to become National Security Advisor to the President of the United States, Michael Flynn. They can't have him hanging around because he'll figure it out. So they decide to go after Michael Flynn. Three-star general served our country for over three decades. And we know they went after him because they told us that too. Bill Priestep, head of counterintelligence at the FBI, the day they interview Flynn, January 24, 2017, his notes say what? What's our goal? to get Flynn to lie so we can prosecute him or to get him fired. Think about what the Obama-Biden DOJ, what their administration did in the last month, the last month they were in power. January 4th, the agents investigating Flynn want to drop the case. Comey tells them no. January 5th, they have the now famous meeting in the Oval Office. Obama, Biden, Rice, Comey, all of them are in there. They're plotting their strategy, how they're going to get Flynn. January 6th, Comey goes up to Trump Tower briefs President-elect Trump on the dossier that they already know is false, just so they can leak it to the press and the press will write the story that they briefed the President on the dossier. And then, of course, January 24th, the day they go, set up Michael Flynn, set up Michael Flynn in his interview. Guess what else they did? Guess what else they did between Election Day and Inauguration Day? That two-month time, guess what else they did? 38 people, 49 times unmasked Michael Flynn's name. Comey, Clapper, Brennan, Biden, seven people at the Treasury Department unmasked Michael Flynn's name, for goodness sake. And of course, Flynn resigns on February 13th. Flynn resigns on February 13th. Now the cover-up is complete. 
Flynn's gone. Everything's fine, they think, until May 9th, 2017, when President Trump fires Jim Comey. Now they got a problem again. The guy who was going to keep it all quiet, he's been fired. Now how do they continue the cover-up? Real simple. Jim Comey leaks his memos with the express purpose of getting a special counsel appointed to investigate something they already know is not true. And that's exactly what happened. We get two years, 19 lawyers, 40 agents, 500 witnesses, 2,800 subpoenas, and a 30 million cost to the taxpayer, and they come back with nothing, absolutely nothing. And so all they got left is to attack the attorney general who had the courage to state the truth right from the get-go, the first time he testifies after he's confirmed. And you guys attack him every day, every week, and now you've filed articles of impeachment against him. It's ridiculous. He had the courage to do what no one else would do at the Justice Department. Sally Yates wouldn't call it spying. Jeff Sessions wouldn't do it. Rod Rosenstein wouldn't do it. Chris Way, Ray sure as heck isn't going to do it. So, Mr. Tringer, I want to thank you for having the courage to call it what it was, spying. I want to thank you for having the courage to say we're going to get the politics out of the Department of Justice that was there in the previous administration. And maybe most importantly, and we're going to talk about this in our side when questioning, I want to thank you for defending law enforcement, for pointing out what a crazy idea this defund the police I, uh, policy, whatever you want to call it is, and standing up for the rule of law. And frankly, we have a video we want to show that gets right to this point. Can we play that video, please? how I characterize this. This is a, mostly a protest. Uh, it, is not, uh, it is not, generally speaking, unruly. Peaceful protest. Peaceful protesters. Peaceful protest. 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 Peaceful protesters. On behalf of myself, my children, and the family of David Dorn, we'd like to thank friends, neighbors, co-workers, and the community for showing all the love and support we've suffered through the tragic loss of my husband, my beloved husband, David Dorn. We'd also like to thank St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department for their hard work and perseverance through this investigation as well as the circuit attorney's office. He dedicated his life to the city of St. Louis, retiring at the rank of captain after 38 years of distinguishable service. Then as a chief of Moline Acres for almost six years. During those years, he's touched so many lives as a friend, mentor, co-worker, and guardian. His life was senselessly taken from me, from us, by an opportunist who had no regards for human life or the law. This didn't have to happen, but it must have been God's plan for David. We need to come together as a community and do better. We need to teach our young people that life is very precious. We as a family are going to be taking some time to focus our attention on healing which is very important as we move forward. We would like David's legacy to be remembered as a loving husband, father, grandfather, brother, uncle, friend, colleague, and most importantly, a child of God. I'm gonna thank you all for coming, and God bless you all.
I hope that uh, Mr. Jordan will never uh, complain about the length of my opening statement. Without objection, I am going to insert the committee's uh, audiovisual policy into the record of this hearing uh, and note that the minority did not give the committee the 48-hour notice required by that policy. Without objection, all other opening statements will be included in the record. I will now introduce today's witnesses. William Barr has served as the Attorney General of the United States since February 14, 2019, having previously served in the same position from 1991 to 1993 under President George H.W. Bush. He also served as Deputy Attorney General and Assistant Attorney General of the Office of Legal Counsel under the Bush administration, was a member of the domestic policy staff under President Reagan, served in the Central Intelligence Agency, and was a law clerk for Judge Malcolm Wilkie of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. In addition to his significant public service, he also has extensive experience practicing law in the private sector. Attorney General Barr received his A.B. and M.A. from Columbia University and a J.D. from George Washington University School of Law. We welcome the Attorney General and we thank him for participating today. Now, if you would please rise, I will begin by swearing you in. Would you raise your right hand, please? Or left hand. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? So help you God. 
Let the record show the witness has answered in the affirmative. Thank you and please be seated. Please note that your written statement will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, I ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. To help you stay within that time, there is a timing light on your table. When the light switches from green to yellow, you have one minute to conclude your testimony. When the light turns red, it signals your five minutes have expired. Mr. Barr, you may begin. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Jordan. Uh, I'm pleased to be here this morning. On behalf of the Department of Justice, I want to pay my respects uh, to your colleague, Congressman John Lewis, an indomitable champion of civil rights and the rule of law. I think it is especially important to remember today that he pursued his cause passionately and successfully with unwavering commitment to nonviolence. As I said in my confirmation hearing, the Attorney General has a unique obligation. He holds in trust the fair and impartial administration of justice. He must ensure that there is one standard of justice that applies to everyone equally and that criminal cases are handled even-handedly based on the law and the facts and with rega art re without regard to political or personal considerations. And I can tell you that I've handled criminal matters that have come to me for decision in this way. The President has not attempted to interfere in these decisions. On the contrary, he has told me from the start that he expects me to exercise my independent judgment to make whatever call I think is right, and that is precisely what I've done. Indeed, it's precisely because I feel complete freedom to do what I think is right that induced me to serve once again as Attorney General. As you just said, Mr. Chairman, I served as Attorney General under President George H.W. Bush, and after that I spent many years in the corporate world. I'm almost 70 years old. I was almost 70 years old and slipping happily into retirement I had nothing to prove and I had no desire to return to government. I had no prior relationship with President Trump. Let me turn briefly to the several pressing issues of the day. The horrible killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis understandably jarred the whole country and forced us to reflect on longstanding issues in the nation. Those issues obviously relate to the relationship between law enforcement and the African American community. Given our history, it's understandable that among black Americans there's at least some ambivalence and often distrust toward the police. Until just last 50 years ago or so, our laws were and our institutions were explicitly racist, explicitly discriminatory. It was not until the 60s that the civil rights movement finally succeeded in tearing down the Jim Crow edifice. Our laws finally came to formally embody the guarantee of equal protection. And since then, the work of securing civil rights has rightly focused on reforming institutions to ensure they better conform to our laws and to our aspirations. That work, it's important to acknowledge, has been increasingly successful. Police forces today are far more diverse than they've ever been. And there are uh, both more black police chiefs and more black officers in the ranks. Although the death of George Floyd at the hands of the police was a shocking event, the fact is that these events are fortunately quite rare. According to statistics compiled by the Washington Post, the number of unarmed black men killed by police so far this year is eight the number of unarmed white men killed by police over the same period of time is 11. And the overall numbers of police shootings have been decreasing. Nevertheless, every instance of excessive force is unacceptable and must be addressed appropriately through legal process, as is happening now in Minneapolis. But apart from the numbers, I think these events strike a deep chord in the black community because they are perceived as manifestations of a deeper, lingering concern that in encounters with police, blacks will not be treated even-handedly. They will not be given the benefit of the doubt. They will be treated with greater suspicion. Senator Tim Scott has recounted the numerous times he's been unjustifiably pulled over on Capitol Hill. And as one prominent black professional in Washington said to me, African Americans often feel treated as suspects first and citizens second. 
the same time, I think it would be an oversimplification to treat the problem as rooted in some deep-seated racism generally infecting our police departments. It seems far more likely that the problem stems from a complex mix of factors which can be addressed with focused attention over time. And we in law enforcement must be conscious of the concerns and ensure that we do not have two systems of justice. Unfortunately, some have chosen to respond to George Floyd's death in a far less pr productive way by demonizing the police, promoting slogans like all cops are bastard, and making grossly irresponsible uh, proposals to defund the police. The demonization of the police is not only unfair and inconsistent with principles of all people should be treated as individuals, but gravely injurious to uh, the inner city communities. When communities turn on and pillory the police, officers naturally become more risk averse and crime rates soar. Unfortunately, we are seeing that now in many of our cities. The threat to black lives posed by crime on the streets is massively greater than any threat posed by police misconduct. The leading cause of death for young black males is homicide. Every year, approximately 7,500 black Americans are victims of homicide. The, mass, the vast majority of them, around 90%, are killed by other blacks, mainly by gunfire. Each of those lives matter. It is for this reason that in selected cities where there has been an upsurge in violent crime, we are stepping up and bolstering the activities of our joint anti-crime task forces. Finally, I want to address a different breakdown in the rule of law that we've witnessed over the past two months. In the wake of George Floyd's death, violent rioters and anarchists have hijacked legitimate protests to wreak senseless havoc and destruction on innocent victims. The current situation in Portland is a telling example. Every night for the past two months, a mob of hundreds of rioters have laid siege to the federal courthouse and other nearby federal property. The rioters have come equipped for fight armed with powerful slingshots, tasers, sledgehammers, saws, knives, rifles, and explosive devices. Inside the courthouse are a re relatively small number of federal law enforcement personnel charged with, defen with a defensive mission to protect the courthouse. What unfolds nightly around the courthouse cannot reasonably be called protest. It is, by any objective measure, an assault on the government of the United States. As elected officials of the federal government, every member of this committee, regardless of your political views or your feelings about the Trump administration, should condemn violence against federal officers and the destruction of federal property. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and uh, I appreciate your uh, listing for me the areas of concern uh, in your opening statement, and I'm looking forward to addressing them all.